Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, um, wherever you are logging in um, from whichever part of the globe. My name is Stephen Rogers, and I am the Executive Director of Africa Faith and Justice Network. It is my utmost pleasure and privilege to welcome you all on behalf of AFJN and our partners, the Dominicans for Justice and Peace and Talitha Kum Africa to today's very important webinar, Tackling Human Trafficking in Africa. Catholic Sisters share successful advocacy strategies. The Africa Faith and Justice Network is the only Pan-African Catholic faith-based advocacy here in Washington, DC. It was founded 40 years ago as a community of advocates for responsible United States relations with Africa. Our mission is inspired by the gospel and it is informed by Catholic social teaching to educate and to advocate for just US-Africa relations and to work in partnership with African people from, for justice, for peace, and the integrity of creation. AFGN is a nonprofit 501c3 organization and is presently sponsored by 28 religious orders and congregations of men and women with a focus on Africa. We also have several sponsors, including the Conrad Hilton Foundation, which sponsors our Women's Empowerment Program, which we'll be talking about, and the Raskop Foundation for Catholic Activities, among other sponsors. We are a non-partisan network. We are solely focused on the critical issues impacting the continent, and we address them from the bottom up with the people of Africa at the heart of the solutions. We are dedicated to de-escalating tensions, finding areas of cooperation, and trying to shift the paradigms. Some of our programs uh, include governance, which is, includes land grabbing, corruption, and the Women's Empowerment Program, which includes, among others, human trafficking, domestic servitude, and early marriages. We work in several countries in Africa, including Nigeria, Ghana, Liberia, Tanzania, Zambia, Cameroon, Uganda, and so on. You can be part of the solution by joining us. You can either be a member as an individual or you can bring your organization as an organizational member. You can volunteer in your community or you can also serve as an intern. Please visit our website, afgn.org for more information on how you can serve to make Africa an even better place for and with Africans. It is now my honor and my privilege to introduce to you our moderator, Reverend Father Aniedi Okure, who is gonna to be today's moderator. Father Okure is a Dominican Catholic priest who currently serves as a consultant for AFJN's Women's Empowerment Project in Africa. And she, he is currently a general promoter for justice and peace and a permanent delegate to the United Nations for the Dominicans. He is based in Rome. Prior to becoming general promoter, Father Aniedi served as the executive director for AFJN, the position that I hold today. And also he was a fellow at the Institute for Policy Research at the Catholic University of America here in Washington, DC. So without further ado, it is my honor and privilege to welcome Father Aniedi, our moderator. Welcome Father, and thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Rogers. Uh, thank you to AFJN staff. And thanks to all who are here for this uh, forum. Uh, I am really privileged to be part of the moderator, to be the moderator of this group. And I think the sisters are going to take us on a good ride in this forum. And let me start with a few preambles. We all know the work that sisters do across the world. And in a special way in Africa, we know that sisters are working with the less privileged members of the society. They are teaching in schools, they run hospitals and clinics, they attend to uh, neglected people, to motherless babies, to teenage pregnant uh, young girls, and to people 
that Pope Francis describes as those who are often consigned to the margins of society. So we know sisters engage in all of this, education, healthcare, social work, and even in legal accompaniment of those who don't have the means to hire big lawyers. So this evening, or this afternoon, this morning, depending on where you are, we have four sisters who are part of a group of sisters trained by AFJN who have decided to go beyond providing services to people to tackling the structures of injustice that keep the people in bondage, that deprive the children of God of their full dignity. And they have done a formidable job. So without much ado, let me start by presenting the sisters. First, I introduce Sister Mary Lily Ricuri, who is a member of the Missionary Sisters of Mary, Mother of the Church. Sister Mary Lily is in Uganda. She's a communicator by professional. She has a master's degree in communication and social sciences from Gregorian University in Rome. She is currently the director of communications at the Secretariat of the Association of Religious in Uganda, ARU. And she's also the coordinator of AFJM and Talita Kum in Uganda, an advocate for social justice. And next is Sister Mary Rose Barnabas Kisanga, who is little sister of St. Francis. Sister Rose is the vocation animator of the child protection and child protection officer of her congregation the Little Sisters of St. Francis in Northeastern region of Tanzania. Following her profession, Sister Mary Rose served as the deputy head teacher of a primary school before receiving her secondary teaching diploma. And since then, she has taught at a Marshall primary school at the minor seminary and served as an accountant in a parish. Then we have Sister Juliet Ifediba, who is a member of the Congregation of Our Lady of Apostles. She's from Nigeria. Sister Juliet is a human rights lawyer and a peace activist. Actually, she is a uh, practice law in Abuja, federal capital, and has a long history of engagement of legal issues in Nigeria and assisting uh, religious communities in their legal challenges. She is currently studying canon law to add up to her civil law so she can be all rounded in helping religious communities. And she is speaking to us from Nairobi, where she is at the Catholic University of Eastern Africa. Then we have Sister Kayula Lesser. Sister Kayula is from Zambia, and she's a member of the Religious Sisters of Charity. Sister is the director of Talita Kum Zambia, a network of religious women working to end human trafficking. Sister Kayula has a master's of science degree in development studies from the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London. So these four sisters have something to share with us. They have something in common. And they are here to let us know how they have shifted from just serving the people of God to tackling the structures of injustice in the various countries. And I would say that doing a formidable job. So without much ado, I will start by calling on Sister Lily from Uganda. Sister Lily, could you tell us how have you, how did you make that transition? What, you know, from 
thing exists that praying and teaching in school and now being out in the public square. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. And uh, uh, first of all, I would like to appreciate God for this moment and all of you that uh, through this network, I've been able to do what I'm going to share with you. That is from the time we got into advocacy as sisters in Uganda, we have been able to identify the line ministries, that is uh, the ministries whom we think are responsible for enhancing the human trafficking and who we task to do their part in order to combat human trafficking. One of these ministry is Ministry of Gender, Labor and Social Development, because it is through this ministry that our people, especially the youth, leave the country to go out. So there we met, we met the commissioner for responsible and we made our ask, what are you doing about the situation? What can we do better? Then we went ahead to Ministry of Internal Affairs because they are responsible for issuing documents for, 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 for the citizens to leave the country. And we also charged them with the task and responsibility of answering why they go ahead to issue documents to uh, the youth who eventually get into trap from out there. Then we also went to Ministry of Foreign Affairs and asked if the ambassadors or the embassies abroad are able to help these people, uh, the survivors or the victims of human trafficking when they're in trouble. Unfortunately, they also told us they had their challenges and even the survivors too say they also have their challenges in dealing with the ministries, but then we called them to answer and see if they can help to, to resolve this issue or even combat it. And then we went ahead to Uganda Human Rights Commission and asked what they are doing to protect the rights of Ugandans who leave their country to do jobs across, across the nation. And we also realized there was nothing much they would do, but then we charged them also with the responsibility of doing much more than what they are doing and then they promised to do so. We didn't stop there. As a team of 32 sisters, we went to the parliament of Uganda and made appointment with the speaker. Then then speaker was Honor right honorable uh, uh, Rebecca Kadaga, who gave us audience. And she even went ahead to disclose that uh, curbing human trafficking or combating it is a little bit hard because the big shots are involved in human trafficking and this attracted the media. And uh, the media uh, was able also to go ahead to do some research and inform people about the phenomena, both locally and uh, internationally because there was a, a, a lady who, who went as a, a, tra a, a trafficked person and in, indeed she was a media person and she she went through what the trafficked people go through and uh, when she came back and published all her stories it really drew the public attention and then we were able to hold a press conference different media houses were called we called the the print media the tv the radio and they re responded much as they responded uh the there was a wide coverage and this also drew the attention of the nation in addressing human trafficking. And then we also have a radio program on a weekly basis, we are able to address the issues of human trafficking, that is to raise awareness. And then uh, we went deeper into finding out the problem roots, that is why is somebody dedicated to, to become a trafficker? And why would somebody uh, willingly go out and accept to be sold into slavery? And then we realized these are human development issues and 
we also developed program to, to do that so that people or parents or families begin to take care in uh, bringing up children so that they do not fall uh, into trap. And then we also organized stakeholders meeting, which attracted uh, an overwhelming turn up from the government uh, uh, representatives, from civil servants, from, um, uh, okay, the civil society, from pastoral agents, the youth, different groups, including uh, other religious denominations like uh, the Muslims and other Christian denominations. And then together we discussed this issue. It was a whole day's uh, discussion. And one of the things, we, we came with many resolutions, but one of the resolutions we came up was to have an, a national prayer. Why national prayer? Simply because human trafficking in Uganda has become a national issue. So we thought if we had a national venue, like our independence ground uh, was used for that, and then we are able to jointly also organize this national prayer, which was last year, 9th of September, and uh, all the different religious uh, groups made statements, and even the government representatives were there. The chief guest was supposed to have been the prime minister, the honorable prime minister, but unfortunately, she now de delegated the minister for gender, labor, and social development. And they also made commitments to collaborate with us in order to combat human trafficking in Uganda. And uh, we, the sisters, have been invited to participate in reviewing labor law. So representatives went there and then there are arrangements being made to involve the sisters in the, to join the parliamentary committee about the same so that we can continue with our discussions and address this issue of human trafficking in Uganda. And uh, we, uh, we, we, are, we are also in line with the media, as I mentioned. And then uh, I, I don't want to underestimate the role of networking. With Talitakum Africa, Talitakum International, we have been able to work together and uh, Africa Faith and Justice Network. So that was a very good strategy so that uh, one would not feel alone, one would not feel like, uh, you know, human trafficking is overwhelming. So when one is bogged down, you can just call a partner and have it, after sharing a few words, you are able to go on to identify other strategies. Thank you, sister. And, yes. Thank you, sister. I'll come, I'll come back to you. Uh, okay. that's, that's, that's quite a, a program of engagement of people. Let me now call on Sister Juliet. Uh, Sister Juliet, could you tell us how did you move from, you know, the corners of the convent to the public square in Nigeria, and what did you accomplish as a group? Good morning, good afternoon, and a good evening to each and every one of you. Now, I'm sure that you are very uh, conversant with that particular verse that you know. In uh, Romans 10, 14 to 15, you know, he says something. He said, how would they call on him to save them unless they believe? And how would they believe unless if someone is sent to them? So this was the case. This was how it is. It was before uh, the advent or the coming into the scene of the Africa Faith and Justice Network. And all thanks to uh, Father and yet you could read the uh, moderator and uh, Sister Eukarya Madweke. I think she's also here, I was also her the other time. So the two of them, it, it all started in 2016 when they visited Nigeria. So then they engaged with the Catholic sisters or the sisters. So what, what were they looking for? They, were, they brought to the fore the issues of uh, so many social ills in particular issues of injustice. I mean, how do we ensure justice in our society? So it was this engagement with the sisters that afterwards the sisters now assembled and they decided 
to start looking into various issues. But then in particular, which one is very important or which one is so germane to the uh, Nigerian society at the moment. And then these sisters decided to deal with the issue of uh, human trafficking. I am sure that each and every one of us that we are aware that human trafficking is a um, sort of hydra-headed phenomenon or a complex problem. And then how do we go about it? In order to really know what is happening, what we did is to come together, identify the problem. We say it's human trafficking. And then how do we go about it? We decided that now we are going to channel because then in Nigeria, there are, we have 36 states. So we decided to move to Edo State. Now, in Edo State, how do we, how are we going to get in touch with what is happening? Here now, we have to engage with the grassroots, with the people, we start meeting with the people, with the Onojis and the Zaikis. These are the local leaders. And then with the people, the inhabitants, the villagers, we begin to ask questions. What is happening with uh, human trafficking in this particular vicinity? So a lot of things, there are a lot of, things, a lot of liberations were made, in particular the issue of brothel. You know, there's a particular brothel built where a young uh, boys and girls, you know, they, they try to groom them for this so-called uh, trafficking. And then the people also, they were afraid of uh, challenging the, the young man in question who built the, the, the hotel. So it was from this particular uh, grassroots that we began to learn what was happening. And then we asked ourselves, what next? What next is how do we then tackle this particular issue? So we begin to look, we began to look for the stakeholders and who are the stakeholders? The villagers, they are the stakeholders. The, the, or not just the local leaders, men and women, they are the stakeholders. The government, the school children, even the people involved, the, the, I mean, the children that they were trafficking, the youth, they were all stakeholders. That's another issue. So we begin to do what I, uh, we call a village to village meeting. From there, we move to town hall meeting. And when we talk of this town hall meeting, what, what are we trying to say here? In the town hall meeting, we have a meeting of where the local leaders, the, village, the villagers, everybody will be in that particular meeting. So from that town hall meeting, each, we begin to educate them and then to listen to them. From then, we move to even to the church. We, begin, we, we started moving to the church, to also reach out to the people wider spread. And then from there, we moved to the government, to different ministries. We went to the Ministry of uh, Women Affairs. We went to meet with the police because, he, uh, like I said earlier, it's a hydra-headed, uh, multifaceted uh, issue. So now we need our hands to be on deck. We went to meet, we had a meeting with the police. We had a meeting with the NAPTI. These are uh, people that are in charge of, uh, it's a national agency for the prohibition of trafficking in person. We also went to meet with the uh, Ministry of Labor. We went, we also met with the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Different various, because Foreign Affairs, you see these people, when they are moving, they saw these people that issue uh, all this uh, and all that. So we met with various ministries and then we also move ahead. So if you meet the echelon of the government, we went to the governor's office, met with the deputy, the wife, everybody, in fact, all hands were on deck, just in a bid to find a solution to this particular issue. So it was all in all this meeting that the sisters, we kept on presenting our issues and then pressing because one important thing there then was that there were, there, there, it, uh, there were no particular policy. And then the Child Rights Act that's supposed to take care of all these people did not apply because for some states that have not adopted the Child Rights Act, it becomes an issue because it cannot apply in that state until they adopt it. So there, were, there was no particular policy per se. So the sister started pushing for policy. 
Because once there's a law in place, that is when you will be able to say, this person has committed this or has not done that. So this is the kind of meeting that we had, which uh, in fact, the sisters, and I must confess, the sisters really gave all the effort because sometimes we move, I think for the Fadoku and Sister Ukeria, they're always part of it. We move in the morning, we sometimes we come back at night because from one meeting to the other, from one village to the other, and from one town hall meeting, from one government place to the other, because we are trying to a kind of form a synergy in order to steam out this issue of uh, trafficking. So thank you. I will still speak more. Let's, let me give chance to others. Thank you, Sister Juliet. May, may I now call on Sister Kayola? Speaking from Zambia. Okay, um, thank you very much. Uh, in relationship to advocacy, as Tarita Kong Zambia, I mean, we, as Sisters of Charity, we've been working on the issue of human trafficking, but uh, with the help from Tarita Kum and um, African Faith and Justice Network, the sisters were brought together. And since then, we've been working as a network. Now, uh, obviously, as a network, we began 2021. And um, so far, what I see really as our success, I can look at it in different, you know, different levels. One level is engagement with government, and then the other level is actually engaging with the communities, especially traditional leaders, and particularly in border points, because Zambia has, um, you know, eight neighbors, so those border points. So what do I see as our success? Uh, one advantage that we have as Zambia is that we actually sought to sit on the interministerial committee, which looks at human trafficking. So the Ministry of Labor, Ministry of um, you know, Home Affairs, that houses this. So that gives us a great advantage because for example, one of the things that we are proud of is that before our sitting on, on this committee, the minister, you know, the, the World Day Against uh, Trafficking in Persons would not necessarily to be celebrated, but not necessarily launched prior to, to the day, like they would do World Malaria Day and they like, and we question that, why is it that, you know, there is no government initiative to launch this? And that was taken up. So it's, it's very interesting for us to see a minister launching that day because of our, our, our initiative. But also uh, within the law, there was uh, a provision in child trafficking was not defined in the way the Palermo protocol protocol uh, defines it in terms of, you know, looking at the means are not being relevant to considering the case. So when that happened, and then sitting on that, we had to, you know, we had to work with other stakeholders, you know, government, uh, in fact, to argue that, no, we need to align our law to what is provided for in the, in the protocol. And so last year, with, you know, our new government, we've seen that actually there's a change in that area. And also, uh, the department, there was no department in the law dealing with human trafficking, although human trafficking as an issue, as I mentioned, is under the Ministry of Home Affairs and Internal uh, Security. So now, as I speak, last year when the law was changed, we actually now have a department with people working there. Prior to that, there was just one person, the immigration officer, who had to attend to it. Therefore, you wouldn't have much in terms of awareness raising, although a number of symposia were held, you know, but afterwards, you know, by government, but afterwards that was not the case. And also because we know that um, uh, government also has other commitments in terms of just trying to, uh, as some of you would appreciate we are in debt. So sometimes they wouldn't have the resources to raise awareness. We committed, in fact, in our statement, when we are writing to government, we committed that as religious sisters, we actually would like to complement what government is doing. So from last year, we committed to raising awareness. That is the people we talked to, 30,000. So between August last year to today, we've actually met that target of people talking to, not the ones that we are talking to on radio or TV. So 30,000, we've just hit that, that number. So that, you know, because information also has been a problem. People, uh, human trafficking in a way is a, is a new issue in some sense in our country. So we had to do that, but every week, literally, we go to radio to profile both Takuza and Talita Kum Zambia, and you know what the sisters are doing. So 
we do TV, but every week we do uh, radio uh, programs. But another thing really that we found as a good strategy is whenever we have uh, teams of sisters working in all the dioceses, so they are the ones that we get the information that I'm talking about, like, you know, raising awareness to 30,000 people in such a short period of time. So we also, when we go to border points, we engage local government there. So we're talking about the representatives of all those who sit on the ministerial committee in Lusaka, which is a capital city. We engage them there so that in a way we get we gain some legitimacy and we work with them. So that has been very, very useful for, uh, for us. And so we've been recognized as, as that uh, organization, as Talita Kum, but also as Zambia Association of Sisterhoods, as you know, a, a group of Catholic uh, sisters working to end human trafficking. So um, we are also training. We've been training um, law enforcers. So we are talking about immigration, the police, as well as uh, you know, uh, people working in, in prisons because sometimes you know, our law has um, human trafficking and human smuggling together. So sometimes, especially from Ethiopia, we do get people who would have been smuggled. And because Zambia does not have detention centers, uh, these people are kept in prisons and we visited, we organized uh, on the and trafficking day, we organized uh, government departments so that we can go and visit, uh, you know, the people that we found. And just in one prison, we found 260 uh, men and um, young boys who would have been going to South Africa. So we said, these would be very much um, vulnerable to human trafficking. And as a way forward now, we are looking to interviewing them. So we see that if they just face administrative, if they have just, you know, have administrative offenses, then we can talk to government so that, you know, they can either be returned to their country or find a solution for, for with, you know, within Zambia. So pretty much that's what we are doing. But really, one of the things that we really want to, to prioritize is just information dissemination, but also helping government, especially in training the, the law enforcers. Um, if you read our trafficking persons report, you do find that some uh, cases of human trafficking are taken as uh, smuggling cases. And sometimes, and that has implications because uh, according to the law that we had, now it has changed. If you are smuggled into Zambia, you actually face 15 years in prison. So we are saying, you know, some people might allow themselves to be smuggled for a reason. So because of, because of that, we try and train the police and you know, law enforcers so that they are able to differentiate between a case of human trafficking, but also a case of uh, a human uh, smuggling. And because of our sensitization, we're finding that people are calling us now to find out if someone has offered, like there are a number of uh, ladies that have called us who are being offered uh, employment, particularly in the Middle East. So they have been calling us, uh, do you think we should go? And we are giving them you know, advice. Sometimes they are asking us, can you be the ones connected with um, the people that are hiring them? And we are trying to do that. And actually someone was just suggesting uh, that perhaps we should actually have a hotline so that people can reach us uh, easily. And we are trying to think about that. Although there is a, you know, uh, a line that can be called, you know, you could go the police and they like, but maybe they seem to have trust in us because of our you know, religious uh, uh, orientation, just because we are none. So we are thinking of coming up with um, a hotline that people can call so that you know we can um, uh, look at their issue. Uh, we we do not necessarily have um, a, a great contact with uh, survivors or victims themselves, and that's one thing that we are looking at so that we can actually follow. If a case has been, you know, if there's a case of human trafficking, we follow from the time that this case has been, you know, uh, we, once the police, you know, once um, the National Prosecution uh, Authority begins this case, we are able to follow because that will give us then a chance for us to see is the law actually being implemented as it is outlined, you know, especially for services to uh, the, the victims. Because if we do not follow in that way, we won't know, we'll know that we will tell people this is what you provided for in the law. But then if we are not following up those cases in that sense, then it would, it would mean that, you know, we won't do good advocacy, especially for victims of uh, human trafficking. I'll end here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sister. Thank you, sister Kayola. We've heard from Uganda, from Nigeria, 
from Zambia. Let us now turn to Tanzania. Listen to Sister Rose. Sister Mary Rose, please, uh, following the lead from your colleagues, could you tell us about the situation in Tanzania? Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Peace and all good to you all. In Tanzania, I think we are the baby. <laughs> According to the presentation that I have had, <laughs> I think we are we are the babies, but I'm happy to present you all this that we have learned by being empowered by the AFJN concerning the human trafficking, especially in Africa and across borders. For me, what I will say is that after being empowered by the AFJN on human trafficking and clearly understood what human trafficking it entails, we were able to do an advocacy visit to the Honorable George Simbachawene, who by then was the Minister of Home Affairs by then. But this issue of human trafficking was very, very new to us, especially to some of us who attended this workshop by then. For us, we thought it was something very different especially me, Rose. It was something very new to me. That uh, for me, I thought it was the traffic is, the, those traffickers who are standing on the road to stop the vehicles and check them if they have mistakes. So it was something very new to me. So I was uh, eagerly, really, and anxious to hear what the human trafficking was. And I thank God, I really grasped it and I was clearly and understood what it entails. So by being empowered by the AFJN through TICAS, we were able to pay the visit to our Honorable George Simbachaweni, who was the Minister of Home Affairs by then. And this made us to ask him some questions after put down the, the points that we discussed on the, during the workshop we had. And we asked him to use the authority of his office to protect the lives of the, and the dignity of the Tanzanians and exploited it. And the, the Tanzanians who are objectified and exploited it through human trafficking. The, he really, he was really, very happy to hear and to see the sisters. We were 18 in number by then. And we also asked him to set up the mechanism to protect the migrant workers who are abused and exploited in our country and across borders, especially those who were being trafficked within our country, especially from rural areas and even those across borders. This was the message that we are trying to give and to, to, to give to our Honorable George Simbachawene by then was the Ministers of Home Affairs. We also asked him to establish a forum for creating awareness in the wider public, especially in the rural areas. And the and many other victims who were where by many other victims are being taken from rural areas to, to, to the cities within the country and even across borders. By, by presenting this to him by then, he was really very happy to hear and see how the sisters tackled the issues of human trafficking and the, how eagerly we, we were serious and the ready to work with him hand by hand in hand by with him and the government to stop this this issue of human trafficking in our country and he, he, he really took it very seriously and he said and he promised us that he will work on it and he also he will support us whenever we want him to do so that's what we were able to share with him the ministers of home affairs by then, who was very impressed by what the Catholic sisters were taking up on the cause of advocacy within our society and tackling the societal justice issues in places 
where we work and the other institutions that are around us as sisters where we work from and where we live. He was also, he, he also promised us to use his authority, the authority of his office to implement what we asked him to do. And indeed he did that. By then I was very happy to see what we really presented to him was being discussed in our parliament. And our government seriously took it in hand and they are really working. And what he said that he will, he will publish into the rural areas and even announce to the, our, our Christian leaders. These issues are being now tackling by the church leaders in the different churches in, in Tanzania. And the government are on it very serious. Now there's no joking towards human trafficking and including all other issues that are affecting the dignity of human beings, especially in our country. So after, after the workshop, we also asked that we were doing after the end of workshop, we, would, we visit the first the ministers. Then after the workshop, we sisters, we organized the, the workshop to, to enforce, to, em, to empower the young people and the other institutional workers in Dar es Salaam, especially in Simbazi Center, if you have been in Dar es Salaam, to teach about it, to teach about the human trafficking and how it entails all, is, all that. So we also involved the media, the radio and the TVs, whereby so many people were involved to listen on and understand what the human trafficking was and all it's see. It's in what it entails. There are so many. I don't know if time is. <laughs> yes. Okay. I will. I'll come back. Let me do this. Thank. Thank you, sisters. Thank you, sisters. Um, Welcome. Let, thank you. I'll do something here. I'll give the sisters one minute each to make. A, you know, if you can say, as you look at what you have accomplished. I know you, there is limited time, mm -hmm. so you are not able to say all that you have accomplished. But I have seen you talking about coming together, building coalition, going as a group to yes. government, sensitizing people in villages. So all that is, this is something entirely new for sisters to do. So this is something new. And I have seen in what you are doing that people look at you as non-political because you are not coming with the political agenda. So they open the doors to you, they share with you, and they welcome what you are doing. So are there some of the challenges you face? If you can do that in about a minute each, uh, then we will open the forum for the participants to interact with you. Uh, let me go back to you, Sister Lily. Uh, in a, one minute, <laughs> What were some of the challenges you faced or something you might want to highlight that you forgot? When we went to the arena, like when we went out, people were, the first thing, people were surprised. What are you sisters doing? What They were concerned. Why are you here? Because what people know is, sisters, as you mentioned, their place is in the chapel and things like that. So we told them we are here because we are concerned about the citizens who go out and at the end of the day, we see we, we don't see them back. And we see others are injured, others lose their body parts. So we would like an answer to this. And then they were like, um, where were you all this time? Because this thing has taken a while. And then we told them there's time for everything. Because at first we thought uh, the government knew what they were doing and uh, because that is really a government issue to protect the citizen. But because we saw that uh, things were going out of hand, we asked mothers, we thought we could also come and add our voices to the public. And uh, that was really it. But what I realized all in all is that people have confidence in sisters, much as uh, we would go without appointment, because people would scare us. Did you make appointment? And we didn't make appointment, but no one turned us off. Everyone gave us uh, an opportunity to express ourselves, to read our letter of concern, and to add our voice to the to the to the to the public. Uh, what I wanted to say, in addition to what I'd mentioned earlier, was as anti-trafficking 
uh, anti-slavery bill was being discussed in 2020, we thought still there's a gap because when Ugandans go out, especially to Saudi Arabia, they are confronted with the kafala law. Kafala law uh, uh, from the Arabic interpretation is that law which makes somebody subject. You become, you become a, a property. So we are trying to argue from this side that some of those gaps should be filled so that those foreign laws should not be applied to the, 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 to the nationals of this country. Maybe I submit later, thank I can you, add something. Thank, thank you, Sister. Uh, uh, Sister Juliet, please, would you give us yes. a brief highlight? Yes, let me say it now because this or this question now. So I want to make it known that initially when AFJ came to Nigeria in 2016, it was designed in such a way that sisters would a kind of be in forefront on this issue of advocacy, this issue of justice. And because, uh, like I said, Nigeria is made, of, uh, made up of uh, 36 states, say large by big country. So we all know that when you raise issues about injustice or you ask questions, why are people poor? There's always a, a negative reaction, particularly from those that are benefiting from it. You know, people prefer give me bread, but do not, you know, ask me why am I poor? But this is what the sisters are trying to do. But then I want to stress here again that the region plays a key role, a major role, in, the, in fact, in all African societies. So because we are sisters, as a sister has earlier mentioned, we are able to surmount a lot of problems. And the, Another thing again that we use to summon so many of these problems is that AFJN Nigeria is a registered entity. It is registered. Because if it is not registered, there is possibility that they may be declared as an illegal organization or that something may happen and we may, be able to, we may not be able to challenge it in court or further. So AFJN was particularly registered in Nigeria so that it will be able to also, while we are going into these uh, issues of injustice and other things, we will also be able to work in accordance with the laws of Nigeria. So, and again, another thing again is that when we started tackling this issue of uh, um, human trafficking, in fact, the initial meeting the sisters had, they were this skeptical. Because as Father kept on saying, you know, we are known for praying diligently and always praying and praying and then doing charity. But I think it's a new dawn that the sisters now have started engaging in the issue of uh, uh, justice, asking questions. Why are we the way we are? Why are things not going well? So when he started initially, sisters were skeptical. They were sort of uh, skeptical that uh, what we people say, maybe the church personnel, the teacher wouldn't they think that we are trying to offend? What would the government uh, say? Wouldn't they a kind of make a kind of uh, allegation or try to muzzle us up? But then I, I must uh, use this uh, opportunity to thank uh, Father Niedi and Sister Eukarya, who kept on saying, no, this is within the social teachings of the church. There's a kind of encouragement and empowerment that they gave. And again, they were leading in front. Because like I said, Nigeria is a big uh, country and there's a lot of uh, one or two. Uh, so they were leading in front so that wherever we are going then, they try to lead. Uh, will I say they are trying to kind of encourage and they kind of tell the sisters that it's okay to get into the issues of uh, social justice. So one of the challenges that we confronted the sisters then was the initial, I call it adamancy, adamant, or people feeling the, this kind of hostility. Hostility in the sense that, why do you want to get yourself involved in what does not concern you? You know, this is the kind of sense that we are having, particularly like the issue of the brother that I spoke about, that a young man opened a brother where they are grooming all these young boys and young girls, and when we confronted uh, him, the answer he gave us was that uh, he was trying to provide services for the community, and here we are talking something else. So now you begin to ask yourself, how do you confront these kind of issues? So while we are talking, people felt you know, a kind of uh, aloofness, not challenge. 
They were like, at this thing, sisters, you are not supposed to be in this kind of issue. You're supposed to be maybe somewhere in the church praying. And then the second one, again, was the issue of denial. You met with uh, people, you are telling, you are saying, stating the obvious that this is what you see happening. And uh, people are denying it and saying, no, it's not us. Now, why were they denying? Because they didn't understand the meaning of trafficking. They didn't understand that these people, they come and they pick all these children, people including the adults. And then they, they, may, they will always promise them, we will provide you with job when you get there. We give you good education, we open a salon. So people don't understand all this. So they thought that the people were actually doing something very good for them. So why we are talking about it? No, there's more to it. Explaining the meaning of concept of our trafficking and what is involved, they were denying it. Then another one again that uh, we met is the issue of intimidation. You know, sometimes the intimidation is so much. We met one uh, in a, one of our meeting in one of the local government already then. Intimidation, <laughs> you know, sometimes uh, even though we will show the fear, but you will really know that uh, somebody is trying to intimidate you, talking, you are saying something, the person is saying the opposite. I remember the one that just happened. And thanks to Father Okure that started explaining to those who, because we are trying to mention the issue the way it is, talk about it the way it is, and the, the, the effect it is having in the, in the society, the, the brain drain, and then uh, all the vices that is breeding in the society. So they, they, they took offense. And then they started talking about uh, logistics. When they talk of logistics now, the people are now saying, you pay us to come and listen to you. So these, these issues, and then sometimes it's like as if to say, you have come to disturb a particular day of uh, bringing something, and they want to, honestly, there are a lot of challenges. But then we thank God. Why do I say we thank God? Because we are sisters. And like I said earlier, people, African, African society has a kind of value attached to religion. So you can imagine beating up a sister and more say a woman. So probably that's why they say, it, but this did not deter the sisters because we kept on pushing. And we thank God that at the end of the day, as we could even see today, for those of you that who may go and check again, we will see that the statistics has drastically dropped. And in those states, let me say in particular, issues of trafficking and all that, because sisters did it in such a way in our various meeting and our various villages that we went to, that we are able to tell people what is trafficking, how they go about it, what it does to our youth, how it depletes the energy and the level of force and every so. Now, parents, including the UNODS, those local leaders, they have now made rules that when you now come into a state or any part to say, ah, we want to take your child abroad to go and give him good life and all that, they will start asking you, what kind of good life? What do you mean? And on the part of government, as we, I'm sure many of us are already aware that AFJN, sisters push and push and push until there was a passage of a, a doorstep trafficking in persons a prohibition law. So now we have a law in place that you cannot come in now and start talking of trafficking or even engage in trafficking without uh, being prosecuted and even forfeiting your houses and so, so many things. So, thank you, sister. Uh, we are not. Thank you. Thank, thank you, sister. So let me go to sister Kayola. Yes, please. The same thing. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Father. Two, two things. One is that I know that we are raising awareness, but sometimes you actually go to very poor uh, places. Mm. We were in Sesheke. Sesheke is a place in Zambia, which is uh, on the west side of Zambia, and it's uh, close to Namibia. So, of course, we raise awareness. People get the information, but then you realize that they are poor. And you know that even if we are, they have understood what human trafficking is, they will, stay, they will still take that risk because they don't have opportunities. So, you know, and we are also in Iwangwa, which, which to the east, which borders um, uh, Mozambique, and people are very poor. So, you, you, you can almost appreciate that information is not enough. And perhaps maybe what is needed is to actually tackle poverty in, in specific areas. Well, you know, uh, information is just a part of mainstream, but you also target, um, uh, what is it, root causes. 
And another thing is, it's a programming issue uh, because we so much focused on human trafficking. And then I, I told you, we go to a place, to a border point, and we find uh, people who have these administrative um, offenses. Should I say, issues of ir irregular migrants. They are not criminals. These are people who have come and be looking to go to South Africa and they like. And you find that because you are so much focusing on human trafficking, you cannot attend to them in that sense because your focus is just on human trafficking. So for me, really, I feel that, I think it's important to insert human trafficking in the conversation of forced migration, to take it that way so that, because I felt so bad personally when you went to celebrate, you know, to, to commemorate the anti-trafficking day, World, tra 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 World Anti-Trafficking Day in the Eastern province. And we went to that border and I find these 260 who are coming to us like we'll be saviors because uh, they're irregular migrants, they're not victims of human uh, trafficking. Then you find them, you talk to them, they tell you their story and just move away because you don't have resources to, to, you know, to, to attend to them. So I, I really think that maybe in terms of programming, it's important to look at it from the point of view, irregular migration while focusing on human trafficking. Thank you. Thank you, Sister. Um, Sister Mary Rose. About the, the challenge for us here, the challenges that we, we face here is the issue of poverty also. Especially you find the, after drawing awareness to them, to the people, many of them comes to us for support, that they want really to be independent, to do something for themselves in order to avoid themselves be, being trafficked and even to help others, their relatives, their family members, not to be trapped in traffickers, with the traffickers. But the, another thing we have found and encountered the challenge, the biggest challenge also during the, we want maybe to draw awareness to these people, especially the young people around us in Tanzania. You find that many of the young people in Tanzania are coming from very poor families. So what they need mostly, they are ready to listen on what you want to tell them concerning human trafficking very eagerly to listen, but to learn and avoid it. But the issue is coming to how will they come in contact with us or come to reach where they will be able to receive this kind of knowledge to help them and even to help other people not to be, to be trafficked. So the issue of poverty in our countries is, an, is a serious issue. Thank you, sister. I, we have some questions here. And I say, sister, okay. Cynthia Sun is up. So this is a question to all of you. Uh, given all that you have uh, talked about, there's a question here. What do you, what do the sisters in your various uh, groups envision for the future? Now that you've stepped up into the public square, you've seen results, what is it you envision for the future? Any of you? Uh, Can I take I, Yes, sister, sister. No, before our people who spoke to us start, may we who have been listening to them maybe say something, please. The four of you are our facilitators, so to say. We have listened, you have given us challenges. I think it's good to also hear from us. Yeah, that's may what I? we are doing. Yes, sister, yes, sister, sister. Why yeah. Not? yeah okay. that's what we are doing. I'm, I'm picking um, up with. I'm picking up questions in the chat box that has been coming in. So what do you envision okay. for the future is a question in the chat box. That's why I'm asking. People are asking okay. questions, yes. Okay, in, a, in looking to the future, it's good to go back, look at the present and plan for the future. I would say that I've been very privileged. Um, campaign against human trafficking in Nigeria didn't start with uh, AFJN. As far back as 2008, or even beyond that, the Nigerian Council of Women Religious had been at the forefront of this fight. Because I came on mission to Botswana in 2008. By 2009, because of the knowledge I had from home, I was able to join the group, our women religious here, sharing experiences because we're a very young church. Botswana has only two dioceses. 
It's a very young church. And we are not really slow starters, but there's a lot we are not able to do because we are small. Be that as it may, when South Africa was to host the 2010 World Cup, it was an opportunity. IOM, Talita Kum, and the Nati trained us in the SEDEC area, the whole South African countries, with that we did a massive campaign. As of that 2009, there were no laws criminalizing human trafficking in Botswana. To the glory of God, it was a noise we made that eventually, 2014, they had a law, 2015, it came to pass, and it is a very comprehensive law. If you're convicted, you lose everything, as in everything, whether legit or not, number one. The other sister that spoke, I forgot number, i just sorry to say sister number three, that said something about human trafficking in the context of migration. When you, now I am working with migrants, refugees and IDP. So I'm getting a wealth of experience from the totality of human development. If you put human trafficking alone without addressing the context of migration, we'll be given paracetamol. Yeah. They put, Push factors are very important, more than the two factors. If you talk about awareness campaign, I am yet to see any country, especially in Africa or any region in Nigeria, let me talk, or even in Botswana, that has not been empowered in information because our campaign was massive. Two things that we can look at for the future is one, poverty. Two, gender inequality. Have we ever asked ourselves why Statistics shows that 85% of victims of human trafficking are actually women. Because they are yeah. the most vulnerable in a society where if there is any, uh, let me say, natural disaster, they are the ones. Wars, our children are recruited as child soldiers. So the poverty and the inequality, I'm talking about gender inequality. I just finished the course on gender inequality and women empowerment. I will soon stop, please. I know because others will okay. have to speak. Okay, yes, this then. Yeah. Thank so you. That, we have to look at human trafficking in the context of human mobility. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, Sister Kayola made, uh, made a similar yeah. point. May I, okay, Sister Juliet, you are trying to respond. Sister Juliet, one of the speakers, yes. All right, thank you very much, Father. Now, I heard Sister Cynthia saying that, uh, yeah, almost all over the world you hear about this trafficking, trafficking, and that people, in fact, a lot of NGO, and many are still coming up. But then we are talking of, uh, at least, this I'm involved, and I, I, let me speak from the bar or even outside the bar because I'm involved. I'm talking about uh, two, 2018 and the trafficking law, and I'm talking about what. Um, the law left and played in it. So I'm talking because I'm involved. So now, as I was saying, there are so many NGOs. Even as we speak in Nigeria, in Zambia, in Ghana, everywhere. But what we are asking here is that who does what? How do we get this work done? Because it is not also out of place to say that some of these NGOs, you know, they just come in and all that and do and do and do nothing. Now, why do I say that AFJN is a key player to the, um, the law that was promulgated because we were involved? Why do I say that the people, I just state in particular, because I was there, including uh, all the, that may be here, the women I do not see, because we moved from village to village. We were at Oredo, we were to Jogba, we were at Oba, we were to the same story everywhere. They don't understand. Even if there was a, we went to Ubogi. They, I remember, I think it was Sister Fikiri that was asking them. He said, how many of you that would like to travel abroad? All hands were up. <laughs> Why? Everybody want to, I mean, it's going for greener and you don't blame any But then, they don't understand the underlying issues about this issue of uh, going abroad and, you know, when they come in, how they know them out. And I'm talking about also the issue of the brothel, which also many of us here too are involved. And uh, I also remember that we confronted, because even the local chief, we are afraid of this young man that opened the brothel, because he seemed to be, he has enough muscle in terms of uh, money to confront whoever challenges. And I recall that day we entered that place, 
maybe the, the courage was because we are, we are sisters. Because I was like, uh, even if they, even if we die, uh, what is it? At least I'm a missionary. Even if I die, no problem. Otherwise, people were so afraid. And we were able to confront this. In fact, it didn't end that day. It didn't end in the month. It didn't end in the months because we have even to got involved with the commission of police, with the uh, a, a department of gender and the trafficking and a lot of things. Even if we also, I, I also wanted also to move to court. There were a lot of things happened. But at the end of the day, at least I'm talking for the one that we were involved, that brought out, it was closed. At the Thank end you. of the day, the silence between us and the police, it was what a, a kind of help to kind of uh, steam out a lot of things. So what I have said so far, please, is what um, is so, is concrete. It's something that is verifiable. Something that is traceable. Thank, thank you, thank so you sister. Thank you, sister. I think what the what the sisters are saying here is is not so much that oh nobody has talked about trafficking ever. No, they have, but they are showing how the advocacy have changed things. That's the story I've heard from Nigeria, from Uganda, from Zambia, from Tanzania. That they actually went out and made things happen. And that's a big difference. You know, that's a big difference. And that's a commonality from all the sisters put together. And if you have questions, uh, AFJN is there. <laughs> the, the contact information is there. You can contact them as well to, to follow up. Director of AFJN, Eukarya at AFJN.org. So all of that will be, will, will be there. So I think, uh, Dr. Rogers? This is a very important topic, and I really am um, very, very much excited about the, the interest in it. It has so many dimensions, as we have already seen, far more than any of us thought the sisters have been doing. So maybe we can just entertain one or two more questions. And okay, can... thank you. Um, there's a question here. As advocacy experts, what advice do you wish to, to have to give when you are first starting out doing advocacy? Now, this is the advice I want to give. First and foremost, because advocate, things like this, because uh, like I, I started earlier, it's a hydra-headed uh, issue. It's not, it's not something that one person can come out and say, I will do. Otherwise, I mean, the person may run the risk of being uh, arrested by those that feel that their territory is being threatened. So it requires networking. So, and in this case, as I am saying, is a network of sisters. Because like I was pointing out, we met a lot of challenges. I'm telling you, there was one that even if the, the sister, um, you carry on for the Kure, we say, they will tell you what happened in Benin, that even Aka was almost uh, attempted that. So it's, it, you need a network. And then you sit down, you ask yourself, what is the goal? Because it's not just going, but it's to find out what is the aim? What is the goal? What do we want to achieve? Is there law in place? If there's no law, please permit me to beg that you push for legislation. You know, sometimes people will tell you, ah, there are so many laws, but it's not working. And then some of the laws are obsolete. They're outdated. They need reform. So I will, I will advise that you push for the law because once there's a law in place, as we are seeing now in Edo State 2018, once that is when you will be able to make arrest and say, no, you have gone against the law. But if there's no law in place and we are just talking about you know, doing charity or doing things, we keep on happening. But if we, if we push for the law, because the, the long arm of the, the law will always catch the offender. So I will advise that we push for the policy, the law, to be in place. That's my own advice. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Sister. I see Sister Lily is trying to say something. And then Sister Samarita. Sister Samarita, OK. Thank you. Um, I would like to maybe add my voice to the government that enjoy remittance from trafficking money. I would outrightly say it is bloody money. And uh, I believe uh, we may have to, we shall suffer the consequences of this because even in Old Testament, God asked when uh, Cain killed his brother Abel, where is your brother? I believe today God is asking countries asking governments, where is your brother? Where is your sister? Because of the bloody money. 
So our spiritual, um, our spiritual consciousness really should wake up. That is one of the strategy. And then about envisioning the future of uh, this human trafficking. Me, I'm seeing uh, a slave-free Africa because government is opening ways for us to have dialogue. And then the civil society is cooperating with us. And then I'm also seeing researchers we are now acting from informed point of view. Uh, research is going on, benchmarking is going on. And then in Uganda, we have uh, advocacy top down. That is, uh, uh, we influence policy at the same time at the grassroots, something is happening. Like in Uganda, we have now network in all the four ecclesiastical provinces and the dioceses. So I'm hopeful that uh, we, shall, we shall be free from slave, slavery. Thank you. Thank you, moderator. Th thank you, Sister, uh, Sister Samarita. Yes, thank you, Father. Uh, my advice to the new sisters, I'm Sister Samarita from the Congregation of Sisters of the Holy Cross. My advice to the sisters who are beginning this advocacy, I would say that please take courage for this ministry needs courage, needs courageous people who can be able to speak out. And this ministry needs people to go to the grassroots. Much as yes, we sustain the government and no top leaders, but needs us to go to the grassroots, talk to the parents, talk to the youth. And I also envision our society to have an empowered youth, to have an empowered society that is able to stand for their rights. They are able to say no. They are able to say yes when there is a need to say yes and when there is a need to say no. Thank you. Thank you, Sister, um, uh, sister, uh, sister Mary Rose. You have some comments? For me, I thank God and I thank you for empowering us and for supporting us to, be to encourage us to be able to stand and be able to, to, to face this challenge. But though it is not easy, it needs a lot of support and really total commitment. For most of, many of us, we are not committed because of the, maybe the apostolates that we have in our various areas. So if possible, we, if we are able everywhere, wherever we are in our countries, the sisters could join hands together and be together to work and fight against this the evil of human trafficking in our countries. Otherwise, yeah. we need also the support. I don't know how it will work to be able to move from one place to another and in, and in, 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 in sustaining the issue of human trafficking and the other issues that it tackles the human dignity. Sister Eukarya, <laughs> uh, your name has come up over and over during the course of the presentation. Do you have any comments on this? Well, I don't really have a lot of comments. <laughs> but to say thank you so much to the sisters that made the presentation. I started working with you people since 2016, you know, in various countries. And you have also energized me to continue to do, you know, what we are doing in AFJN. I want to thank also the other sisters who are also doing and tackling the issue of human trafficking, because I know it's not just AFJN sister, you know, group. You are part of the large group of sisters. So, you are representing the sisters and the ministry of the sisters. We, AFJ, and journeyed with you because you had the time to journey with us and you have done tremendous uh, job. And that's why we wanted you today to share with others so that as we have empowered you, you can also empower other sisters. When we started this, the idea of uh, putting the sister's life in danger, but the way you just keep on doing what you are doing. So you are already, you know, being in the public. So I want to thank you again. And I want to encourage you to continue. Work of advocacy is not a one day job. It's not a bed of roses. 
we all experienced it together, you know, but we have been safe. Nobody has been hurt. Nobody has been wounded. Nobody, we have been protected. And we believe that we will continue to be protected. Expand your network. So don't just limit it to just AFJN group. Expand your network. That's why we are called network. We have lay people that are also working with the sisters. Barista Amaka is here. I think Amaka, you are still there. In Uganda, yes. in Tanzania, we had Denise, we had them. So is sisters led? You were leading the, you were leading while you know others were joining us. So it wasn't just us alone. It was all of us. And that's the only way. You know, we have this symbol. Um, 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 Spider web unites, it ties up the lion. That is almost like our motto. So thank you so much for you know coming to do this to share your experience with all of us. Thank you. Thank you, sisters. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, uh, formidable panelists. I know you had a lot to share. We are sorry that uh, time is limited, so there's time constraint. And thank the rest of you for staying uh, for this. We are very grateful. Uh, somebody made a comment here that this is a new form of evangelization that the sisters have taken up, and truly it is. So with that, I will turn the mic back to Dr. Stephen Rogers to close the session. Thank you so much, Father. And um, I think Sister Eukaria said it all. Uh, I give it up to you, Sister Eukaria. Um, can you just raise your hand again so everybody see you? Sister Eukaria is a women's empowerment pro um, coordinator. She has been working with all of these um, sisters all over the continent in some of the countries that I named. And um, she's been developing this network. She's been, you know, um, going out on the, on the front, as, as I said, and she's been on the front line and um, the sisters have really energized um, our women's empowerment program. I want to thank you for doing that, for highlighting um, the work that our sisters are really doing. As one of you said, when people listen, when you come out for being religious, but also being women, you have an impact that we, the men, have not been able to have. And I really appreciate that. I want to thank the four sisters, Sister Mary Lily, Sister Mary um, Kisanga from Tanzania, Mary Lily from Uganda, Sister Juliet from Nigeria, and then Sister Kayula from Zambia. You, all four of you have really shed light. This is just a tip of the ice badge. Unfortunately, we don't have much time. Now, as you go on, the question you might want to ask, what can I do? I haven't had this information. You can do a lot of things. You can take action. You can join AFJN. We have individual memberships. We have organizational memberships. You can be part of this um, um, great movement. And also you can, in your, in your communities, you can volunteer. The work of AFJN continues to evolve as the needs be. People on the ground, they tell us what is important to them and we work with them to make sure that that work is done. That's what we have heard from these sisters who are in these different countries who have articulated the problems that are needed and we are basically working with them. I want to thank you all. I want to thank all of you for coming on today. I know we would love to listen to them more. Unfortunately, we have run out of time.